Okay, good morning everybody. I think we're just going to have a couple minutes here. Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order in just a couple minutes. Um, I, I, if I could please, again, just ask everyone in the audience, uh, it's, it's great that we have a public participation, but again, you have to remain quiet so that the meeting can proceed efficiently without interruption. Uh, and just so that other folks in the room can hear the discussions going on between the counselors and the commissioners uh, and the staff of, uh, of the state of New Hampshire. Oh, no. So we'll just wait for a couple more minutes and uh, we'll get the main counselors settled in the room.
in. We just need to make sure that we don't get riled up. We want folks to be able to stay and participate, of course, but we just don't want it to get so loud that we can't, can't proceed. Okay, now we have one ceremonial item uh, to conduct today. Uh, the swearing in of our a new state representative, Captain Longo. Uh, of Edward, is Captain here? Thank you. Good morning. Come on up, Captain. Congratulations. Thank you.
1987. From the New Hampshire Health and Education Facility Authority, could I please have a motion to accept the resignation of Joe Duncan of Meredith? So moved. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the resignation is accepted. From the Waste Management Council, could I please have a motion to accept the resignation of Nancy Kenner of Lee? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the resignation is accepted. From the Speech, Language, Pathology, and Hearing Care Provider Governing Board, could I have a motion to accept the resignation of Mary Ellen McKay of Nashua? Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mary Ellen's resignation is accepted. From the University System of New Hampshire Board of Trustees, could I have a motion to accept the resignation of Wallace Stevens of Exeter? Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Stevens' uh, resignation is accepted. And from the Volunteer New Hampshire Board of Directors, could I have a motion to accept the resignation of Lori Galetta of Gosstown? Mm -hmm. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And with that, that resignation is accepted, and that concludes our resignations for today. We have a pretty long list of confirmations to work through and discuss. We'll begin, to begin, could I have a motion to confirm the Rosemary Board of Nashua to the Board of the Licensure of Interpreters for the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And Rosemary is confirmed. Could I please have a motion to confirm Catherine Susie of Derry to the Board of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy? Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the Susie is confirmed. Could I now have a motion to confirm Amy Altshauser of Salem to the Board of Mental Health Practice? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any is confirmed. Could I please have a motion to confirm Vincent Fiacchetti, the third of Gillington Ironworks, to the Board of Registration of Penal Directors and Embalmers? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Confirmed. Now, could I please have a motion to confirm Helen Hanks of Lockmere as the Commissioner for the Department of Corrections? Governor, I move the confirmation of Helen Hanks of Lockmere as Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Commissioner Hanks is reconfirmed. Could I please have a motion to confirm Norman Frank of Ackworth to the current use advisory board? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Noting the no vote, Mr. Bernanke is confirmed. Could I please have a motion to confirm Jonathan Hanson of Bow as the director of the Division of Administration for the Department of Corrections? So moved. Any discussion? No? Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Hansen is confirmed. Could I now please have a motion to confirm Alba DeRosa of New Durham to the Fish and Game Commission? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Could I now please have a motion to confirm Ryan Kaplan of Rye to the New Hampshire Real Estate Commission? Second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Kaplan. Uh, Councilor Warrington. Governor, I received contacts from realtors about this nomination, and, um, and I spoke with the nominee, a uh, very nice young man. Uh, but the concern was that he has only been licensed 
as a broker since February of this year. And people did not feel that he was qualified to sit in judgment of other brokers. There's also a concern that he makes the third um, commissioner from the Seacoast area and that there isn't adequate diversity. Uh, I spoke with him, and again, a very nice young man who said that um, he had completed about 12 transactions. So um, I'm going to vote uh, in opposition, not anything personal, but I just don't feel like he has the qualifications to serve. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor of Mr. Kaplan, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Opposed. I, I, I apologize. Um, can, can we do a quick roll call? Because I, I, I didn't quite. It, it's a close one. <laughs> I just want to make sure we, we could go around and just do a roll call so we have it. Council Kennedy. No. Council Kennedy. No. no. Yes. Council Gavin. No. Council Gavin. No. Council Gavin. No. So with that, the confirmation is denied. Could I please have a motion to confirm Sue Hannon of Derry to the New Hampshire Retirement System Board of Trustees? So Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Opposed. Opposed. With that, Ms. Hannon is not confirmed. Could I please have a motion to confirm Eric Lassard of Concord to the Pharmacy Board? So Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any vote? Mr. Lassard is confirmed. Could I now please have a motion to confirm Madeline Minot of Concord to the Rivers Management Advisory Committee? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any vote? Madeline is confirmed. Okay, please have a motion to confirm James Adams of Pittsfield to the State Veterans Council. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Councilor uh, Kennedy. Just, uh, Jim Adams is uh, a longtime uh, veteran advocate, worked tirelessly for the veterans of the Minnesota so Flash is Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, Any opposed? Okay. Madison's confirmed. Okay. Keep doing good stuff there, Jim. We're watching you. <laughs> Can I now please have a motion to confirm Jackie, Jackie Eastwood of Durham to the University System of New Hampshire Board of Trustees? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Confirmed the Board of Trustees. That concludes our confirmations for today. I do have a, as we did the meeting last week, I have a pretty long list of nominations, if you'll bear with me, to read into the record for consideration over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> to the Board of Acupuncture Licensing Therapy, I nominate Diane Chase of Nashua. To the Board of Landscape Architects, I nominate Catherine Weiss of Nashua. To the Board of Mental Health Practice, I nominate Deborah Robinson of Guilford. To the Community Development Finance Authority, I nominate Jared Reynolds of Concord and Michael pa Plathman of Sugar Hill. <coughs> to the Dental Hygienist Committee, I nominate Mary Duquette of Hockington. As the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Education, I nominate Christine Brennan of Ossipee. As the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Employment Security, I nominate Rich Labors of Concord. As the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Information Technology, I nominate Ken Dunn of Hooksick. As the Director of Security and Training for the Department of Corrections, I nominate Paul Raymond Jr. of Concord. To the Family Mediator Certification Board, I nominate Keely Noyes of New Boston and Francis Lane of Newfield. To the Fire Standards and Training Commission, I nominate Neil Irvine of New Hampton. To the Higher Education Commission, I nominate Sean Fitzgerald of Keene. As a Justice to the New Hampshire Circuit Court, I nominate Philip Cross of Portland and Daniel Swaggart of Warner. 
to the Juvenile Parole Board and nominate Michael O'Connor of Swansea and Timothy Flatterson of Franklin. To the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts, I nominate Roger Brooks of Concord, Jason Torres of Sugar Hill, and Peter Warburton of Exeter. As a pharmacist for the Department of Corrections, I nominate Matthew Urbach of Dunbar. As a second level pharmacist for the Department of Corrections, I nominate Kelly Brown of Canyon. And as a third level pharmacist for the Department of Corrections, I nominate Asagina Dacopoulos of Concord. As a fourth level pharmacist for the Department of Corrections, I nominate Jeffrey Sims of Boston. To the Public Utility Commission, I nominate Carlton Simpson of Hampton. To the Speech, Language, Pathology, and Hearing Care Provider Governing Board, I nominate Tim O'Meara of Hampton. To the Water Council, I nominate Michelle Davis of Concord. And to the Waste Management Council, I nominate Paul Mosher of Durham. And that concludes the nominations for today's meeting. Moving on, we have our consent calendar. I'll begin by asking for a motion to adopt the consent calendar agenda. Second. There's a motion, there's a second. Any discussion or request to remove items for further discussion from the consent calendar? Councilor Wheeler? We remove item 5B, please. 5B. Okay. Any other items to be removed for further discussion? Can we remove item 5A, please? 5A, thank you. Any other items? I'll give everyone a moment. What items are there? Okay. So, seeing no more requests to remove items, all in favor of the consent calendar. Consent calendar agenda, with the exception of items 5A and 5B, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And with that, that version, that portion of the consent calendar agenda is moved. Could I get a motion? To, we'll take these separately if that's okay. Could I have a motion to adopt a consent calendar agenda item 5A? So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? I believe this is an item from the Department of Division of Physical Health, and I think the Commissioner is here. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Katya. Um, my question is, it looks like we've really made no progress on this since we approved this contract. It's so obviously a very important service implementing the suicide prevention line, so I'm just asking for an update on where we are at getting this implemented. I'll let Katya Fox speak to that. So, good morning, Governor and members of the Council. Um, I'm Katya Fox. I'm the Director of the Division for Behavioral Health. In response to the question about this particular contract, we've made significant progress. Um, there have been a number of efforts um, to bring together all of the relevant parties that need to uh, be involved with the implementation of 988. We are asking for more time, same dollars. Um, to continue that work. As you know, 988 is a three-digit number that is for the crisis line, what's known as the suicide prevention line, um, and that is transitioning to a nationwide number. So we have um, head as of our only provider right now. There will be another one coming soon um, that answers that, um, that national number, which is an 800 number. Um, the FCC approved 988 to be that line effective um, July 1st. And so we have worked with um, the Department of Safety and with a number of community providers um, and have four or five working groups that are all going into the nitty gritty details in order to make this happen. Um, so there has been significant work. I could provide a ton more information, um, but I'll stop here. Can I ask you, the extension is until uh, January of 2022. It realistically doesn't look like you will be able to meet that deadline to complete that work. Yes. Yes. We have to. We have to. We need to be ready. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Schneider. Thank you, Katja. Um, so for the past six months, we have not had any invoices come in. Is that correct? Um, I will. I will need to check. Um, if 
that's if that's what's indicated, but it may have happened since um, this was put on the agenda for two, um, two weeks ago. But the ultimate deadline is July of 22 to have the system implemented and up and running, correct? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, seeing no further discussion, all in favor of item 5A from the consent calendar agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any vote? Should I get a motion to adopt agenda item 5B from the consent calendar agenda? Second. Discussion. But there is no additional cost as a result of this amendment, yet there are two change orders for $300,000 um, for implementation of this AET. Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Governor and Council. Bill Katz, Assistant Commissioner for the DOT. Uh, basically, the restructuring of the, of the, of the contract. Uh, we were to go up the cost for this change order to put in the restructuring so there was no net increase in the bottom line of the contract. So part of this restructuring was due um, to some delays uh, to, to the project we had originally intended to have this project, uh, the Dover Rochester Coal Project. Um, there's a contract for later on in the agenda for that. Um, we were originally supposed to have it out a couple of, about a couple of years ago. Um, so the contract had um, you know, some maintenance uh, costs associated with that. That maintenance had been deferred since the project uh, was delayed by a couple of years. So um, in restructuring the contract um, and redoing it to um, account for the um, implementation of ADT versus ORT, um, we were able to balance out the cost so that's a no net increase. Although, in paragraph 3 of the second page, it states, in addition to the authorization of ADT implementation, the department requests approval of two change orders totaling 321,000. Is that going to come to us separately? No, that is included in this contract amendment. Okay. So the original contract, the, so we're just trying to be transparent. The original contract did not have that um, that task order in it, um, but with the, like I said, with the savings and the restructuring, we were able to accommodate this task order within the contract. So for transparency, it is an added work item to the original contract, but as I said, it's been absorbed within the bottom line contract total. Thank you. Further discussion on uh, Council with Yes, Governor. Um, how much input was given to eliminating the cash lanes? I mean, this is the design for this one, but there's another item to construct. Um, you know, zero cash lanes, eliminating the cash lanes. So how many people are on Easy Pass now? How many people are paying cash as a percentage? Um, and I can't more specifics. I'm speaking off the, off the top of my head a little. Uh, a little. So system-wide, it's around 75%. Um, easy pass uses 25 percent um, cash uh, payment. It's, it, I think on the seacoast it may be, I can check specifically those, um, those classes, it may be uh, a little uh, lower easy pass usage. Uh, but as, as far as public input, um, you know, we took both options when we went out to public information meetings. Um, most of um, so, uh, let me put it this way, there's a lot of support for ADT in the Seacoast area. Uh, particularly the Dover Toll, a lot of uh, um, adjacent residents were very supportive of the ADT versus having a, a, a barrier toll there. Um, we heard that support at some of the GASSET meetings in Dover and Summersworth um, a week ago. Um, through the 10 year plan process in, in uh, previous 10 year plans in 2019 and 2018, um, the um, conversion to AET or all electronic tolling versus open road tolling was was vetted and um, was authorized in those uh, amendments, uh, those updates of the 10-year plan. So I think there's been a lot of um, you know public involvement in, in making this decision. 
the authorities. So were there how many public hearings were there? Were there all over the state on this issue or just the ones you mentioned? Well, um, you know, the gaps in hearings that we had in 2018 and 2020, as you know, were, were, all over the, were, were all over the state. Primarily um, at House of Public Works and at the project-specific meetings in the Seacoast in Dover and Rochester, um, the options were, were, were vetted. But anybody from uh, the whole state who happened to go through that poll has to pay, right? So we didn't really vet that in the other part of the state? I mean, why not stay with choice? Why not allow people to pay cash? Why go cashless? Uh, and uh, if, if we were to go cashless, the second part of the question is, suppose you, you go through the toll and you can't pay. What's the process? And then what's the penalty if you don't pay timely? Yep. Um, as far as going to AET versus ORT, I mean, there were a number of reasons that affected that decision. Um, the AET was all electric all electronic tolling and, and not having the option of a much smaller footprint for savings in, in construction. Um, certainly, I think that's the way the tolling industry is, 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 is going now, some of the expectations from, from the public. There are a lot of safety benefits. There isn't a month or two that goes by that we don't have an accident at the Dover or Rochester tolls with people striking the barrier, um, things like that. Um, there has been one just as recent as uh, two weeks ago, uh, before the before the site was supposed to come up with the, um, with the last GMC meeting. So a lot of that, uh, you know, plays into the um, into the decision making as, as far as looking at all electronic tolling versus maintaining um, the barrier toll. Um, there are economic, there are um, environmental benefits as well, without having to stopping and, and starting. And as far as um, uh, people that go through the tolls that uh, uh, don't realize that there are many options uh, to pay. There's pay by plate, there's plug pay online, um, and um, I would also point out that currently, you know, today, we are essentially all electronic tolling um, in the overnight hours when the traffic volumes are very low and it's um, not really economically efficient to uh, continue to staff and maintain those, those toll classes. So since COVID and now permanently, we have essentially been AET in the evening hours from, from I think, 10 to 5. Who made that decision? Uh, the, the department did. Without the council, even though the council sets the toll rate, they just eliminated cash, which is part of the toll rate okay. at night. Well, we made it as part of a kind of a, a business decision of looking at the economic uh, efficiency of, of continuing to staff and maintain the toll plazas in those overnight hours when the volume of toll revenue didn't uh, didn't cover the um, didn't cover the uh, pay for the people working there. Assistant Commissioner, it's good to see you. Uh, in addition to the economic benefits of the, the cost savings in addition to the environmental benefits, uh, in, in addition to the many safety benefits, does electronic tolling also relieve congestion on our highway? Oh yes, very much so. I mean, there's always, uh, we saw that in Hooksit and uh, Hampton um, significantly when those barrier tolls went to open road tolling and had the um, at highway speed tolling option. And by relieving congestion, do we encourage tourism in our state, which is a major economic driver for our state? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Further discussion? Council Ken? Thank you, Governor. Um, having grown up on a total system my whole life, on the road system, um, we, we definitely, um, when I was younger and where we are today, it's a total transformation. Um, Remember the old man of the mountain tokens? That's what you did. You threw them in the basket and you went on your way. And now we're, we're probably going slowly over time and we're taking out uh, the tax system. Uh, for me personally, um, we've been stranded, not knowing what to do, past uh, midnight coming back from a hospital or from a 
you know, a Patriots football game. I didn't know what to do when I got there. And then I finally read the signs and said, well, proceed. And then, you know, the camera will flash and then go later with the mail. Um, I'm a traditionalist. I really think there should be a lane for passion um, for the public um, who feels they need to do that. Maybe uh, 20, 30 years from now, we'll, we'll get away from that. But there's still a generation of people who want to pay for cash. So. Um, on the 12 that's not used, what happens to it? If it was in the 
uh, within the agenda. The item was removed by the department. Item was removed by the department. They withdrew the item. The department requests to remove it after moving. Okay. Yes, uh, Council Chief. In regards to agenda item 9, um, this is testing with clear choice. My question is um, we're not accepting private insurance to offset the cost. Are you referring to? Number nine, which is convenient MD. Exactly. Okay, so that's post accidental needle stick testing. So that is not COVID testing. Right. So this is for our volunteers that have an accidental needle stick while providing vaccination that we cover them to get the series of tests. So that, that responsibility is on us. Okay, thank you. Yep. Additional questions on the exams? Council Gatsis? Thank you, Governor. Uh, the department was issued a letter January 15th from CMS. Mm -hmm. And that letter is stated that you overspent your budget line item by $400 million. Or $490 million. And the um, federal government was looking to get back $110 million. Have we sent them any money, or where are we at with that process? And why wasn't anybody notified about the letter? The, 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 we're still in process with the federal government, so this relates back to the district waiver that was signed in 2016. Um, at that time, there was a budget neutrality factor, and between 2016 and 2020, we had two issues within our state, the opioid crisis and COVID. So what we're what we're talking to CMS about is is about readjusting the budget neutrality factor, the original design of the waiver. That's still ongoing and it has been ongoing for a year. Um, but I'm going to let Attorney John John Camilla speak to that. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, for the record, John Camilla, Attorney General. Council, when we got this letter, uh, I'll start by saying we, we don't agree with the conclusions of the letter. Uh, we have, we've had discussions with CMS. Um, who has agreed to take another look at this and continue discussions on this issue. This letter is sort of an odd thing for CMS to issue if you notice near the end of it. CMS is not saying here they've actually issued a disallowance. This letter kind of summarizes their conclusions, asks whether we would voluntarily repay the money, and says if we don't, they might issue a disallowance. We've since had discussions with CMS uh, they're not issuing this allowance at this time. Those discussions are ongoing. So we're hopeful we can resolve this. Uh, if we don't resolve this, given that we disagree with the conclusions and we feel strongly that we're right, this could develop into litigation. But for now, the discussions remain ongoing. We're hopeful we can resolve this. And, and I'm, I'm going to add my two cents here. This budget neutrality agreement uh, essentially was created long before I got here, long before Commissioner Shibanek got here. Back in the previous administration. Um, to be very clear for the state, our office, the commissioner's office, our actuary all disagree with the federal government's potential conclusion here, which is why, uh, again, we, we're more than willing to litigate it. We feel like we have the data and the formula and all the pieces, if you will, on our side that they are completely, that we've overspent all this money. is absolutely not true. Um, and so that's why it hasn't really been brought forward because it's still, we're still doing our best to resolve it. Um, but again, they're bringing something up that didn't even happen with this administration and it was really over, I think, five or six years ago at this point. But we have to, but we have to address it as best we can. And obviously, if there's litigation and we move, where do we find the money to pay? We'll send you a bill. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't think, I, I gotta be honest, I'm very confident that the data is on our side. And that will be litigated. Again, the Biden administration is coming down and we're fighting with that. Has the fiscal committee been notified about this? Has the fiscal committee been notified about this letter? No. Right now, it's the I don't think it's even close to being resolved at this point. We've had several meetings with them. We have several more meetings 
um, to go with them. So we really don't know where it's going to land at this point. This, this has been ongoing because the discussions went for literally years. Yeah. Years. So this is waffles. I know this letter is dated January 15th. Um, we've been pushing back on them on this issue for some time. I would think that somebody would notify fiscal that this letter is out there. We can certainly share a copy of the letter. Can I just ask that a copy of the letter be distributed to all of the councilors? Sure. Further discussion on this or, or other items, or you know, I know there's more of a general conversation. Uh, um, Councilor Kenny, I would say, Commissioner, this is uh, a contract to increase the loan community integration, integration health.
might be a better word to see if we want them to be vaccinated, we want them to be tested um, before they arrive here. That's all. Just asking. Well, again, if that's something the legislature wants to take up, but it's a direct federal program that the state is not directly involved in. So, so we, we're not giving any of that information.
since she was in the audience, and I didn't know it, I just wanted to point it out. And I appreciate Commissioner Arlinghouse and Virginia's effort with regards to using internship and using the process of state government to be allowed to be able to go through the joint um, kind of uh, various committees, historical committees, to uh, uh, finish this process and to make it a part of her mission statement that she uh, started out with with her internship. So thank you. Thank you. So moving on, I'd ask for a motion to adopt agenda item 13 from the Department of Health and Human Services from the Division of Medicaid Services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Will. Yeah, Governor, this contract is, uh, it, our agreement is unusual in that it uh, allows for an unlimited number of renewal options that are after. And so I wanted to know the, you know, the justification for that and should that pass, will any renewals come to the governor and council? Um, this is the intergovernmental transfer with the county government, so I will um, have Henry come up and speak to that. Thank you for the question. Um, Henry Lippman, uh, Medicaid director. We are, this is, implements the state statute each year for the counties to be able to make, as the uh, commissioner mentioned, the transfer to fund um, long-term care and home and community-based services. So I think that's why we expect it every year if we're going to be able to follow the statute, we'll need to come back to you, and we will come back to you every year. So you will come back. It sounds to me like something that we should probably put in the model and not have this automatic authorization going forward. But I just wanted to make that comment. Further discussion on item 13? Okay, seeing no further discussion, all in favor of item 13, please signify by saying aye. Aye. No. Going to no on item 13, it does pass. And now it's for motion to adopt agenda items 14 and 15 for the Department of Health and Human Services from New Hampshire Hospital. So moved. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Items are approved. I'll now ask for a motion to adopt agenda items 16 through 20 from the Department of Health and Human Services from the Division of Economic and Housing Stability. So moved. Any discussion?
Councilor Wheeler. Thank you, Governor. Um, item 22 is for $13.5 million for mobile vaccine vans and personnel, I assume. Um, can you tell me how many vaccinations you expect to get for this $13.5 million? We have no way to know that um, before we start the process. This contract will be responsible for doing all of our homebound vaccinations. So for our elderly and the infirmed that are home and can't get to a vaccination clinic, they will be doing those. Um, they will be uh, doing scan-out mobile sites across the state. They will be doing boosters. They will be doing first-time shots. Um, so they will be doing um, all parts of the vaccination. So I have, we can't estimate how many at this point because we don't know what the update is going to be on boosters. We don't know what the update is going to be on kids getting vaccinated from 5 to 11, which is, is supposed to be coming up soon. Um, we do know that several thousand people were homebound and got their vaccination through our home mail program. This contract will be also taking care of that. For the question, Governor? Sure. Is this limited to just homebound? No, no. It's not limited to home. No, so the, the vaccination program through on-site is going to be mobile clinics that are going to stand up across the state, so pop-up mobile clinics. And do we have a metrics in place to measure um, what we're getting for our money, how successful we are with this $13.5 million? They have to report each vaccination to the Department of Public Health. Yes. And, and that information would be available publicly? Um, the number of vaccines, yes. Yeah, just the number, not names. Yes. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Stevens? In regards to fixed sites, um, the goal is five sites, 60 hours per week, roughly, as you know, seven days a week. So the goal is 1,400 um, vaccines per site. Is that correct? What? Are you, are you still on number 22? 22, yes. Um, I would have to look at the contract and see what the numbers are specifically. Um, really, you know, our conversations with on-site is around our need. So, although we may have a minimum of four or five sites in there, if, if we have to ramp up and do additional uh, mobile clinics, for example, we did those for elderly housing units and things like that, they're more than willing to stand up and do additional ones. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council Whitaker, sure. one further question is, is any of this paid for with the money coming in if um, 9, B, or D were passed? This is FEMA reimbursed. Excuse me? This is FEMA reimbursed. Thank you. Separate funding. Federal, federal money. Yeah. Separate funding. Yes. 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 In a couple of parts of the state with regards to the COVID numbers, Cross County and I believe um, Southwestern New Hampshire. So when you look at these mobile um, sites um, through this contract, are you prioritizing those mobile um, sites to those areas? We're going where the need is. So one of the things that we ask and we keep track of is what the hospitals can handle and what the private sector can handle. So uh, initially, before the surge in Coas County, you know, the hospitals in that area said that they were more than able to handle that surge, uh, the vaccine, the vaccine uh, clinics. Now that they're having a surge, yes, that is exactly what we would do. Um, we know the hospitals are spent, but they have staffing issues, they have high COVID numbers. So if we can go up and supplement their, if we can go up okay, and I'm going to pause the meeting and, and ask again that you cannot be disturbing the meeting. By all means, we want the public to participate, but you, the repeated disturbances are not going to be, we're going to have to ask you to leave, and we want folks to be here. We want the public to participate, but it has to, it has to continue, uh, again, allowing the state to do the business of the government. Sorry, So as the hospitalization rates increase in the North Country, um, that is exactly what this contract would do, is to go up and supplement uh, the vaccine clinics in the North Country so that they can concentrate on providing care in the hospitals and not so much on the vaccine. Okay, thank you. Yep. Councilor Gazza. Thank you, Governor. Can you tell me how we spent the first $2.2 million? Are we still on number 22? We're still on 22. Um, I can get you that information. So we've increased from $2.2 million, mm -hmm. or whatever this started, to $13 million for four months. The state has initially had 
many, many, do over a dozen fixed sites that we were doing vaccinations with the assistance of National Guard. We no longer have those vaccine sites now and we're relying on our contract services to do all of it. And that's, that's what this is. Four additional sites? At least four additional sites. There, there will be much more than that um, as smaller mobile vaccine clinics and the homebound population. What would you say is the percentage of vaccinated people in the state of New Hampshire? Um, we're right around 70 percent. So we're doing 13 million for 30 percent. Um, we're doing 13 million for 30 percent, and then you have to add in the boosters, the third shots, for everybody that got Pfizer, and then we were going to work 70 percent of the eligible vac uh, eligible population. So that includes everybody over the age of 12. So very shortly, we're going to see approvals for age 5 to 11. We ha now have a third booster for Pfizer. We will see a third booster for Moderna. We will also see a uh, second shot for, for Johnson & Johnson. So everything up until December 31st, on-site is going to manage this. I expect that as we continue to see um, additional boosters, additional age ranges, we may be coming back for additional money or we may have to set up sites ourselves. It depends on whether the hospitals can manage the, the volume that they're going to have. Sounds good. Can you tell me how many folks at 13 million would accommodate? I, I, I don't, I can't tell you how many people are going to take a vaccine in the future. likely be, I mean, definitely be expected that it is more expensive to deliver vaccines to the homebound when you have to travel there and do one vaccine than to set up a fixed site and, and with the National Guard and do many. Is that right? Yes. I, I, we, we, it took us, it took us three, four, five months to do the homebound population, which was in the thousands, a uh, couple of thousand people, um, versus several thousand doses of uh, vaccine going out every day through our six sites. And once the vaccines are approved for the 5 to 11 year olds, we no longer have the National Guard sites for them to get vaccinated, so we will be relying on this provider and other contractors to provide these services. Is that I expect that uh, children age 5 to 11 that want to get the vaccine, whose parents want them to have the vaccine, will get their vaccine either through school-based clinic, through the regional public health networks, or through their local pediatrician. There may be some private vaccine clinics that are stood up, um, but we, we have a system in place we do it with our flu vaccine at school-based clinics. So I expect that a lot of them are going to go through a very similar system. And for assisted living facilities, uh, where I know you are doing private con um, setups, mobile setups, these kinds of um, setups will be done by these kinds of um, This contract and, and probably several other private providers will do assisted living. Nursing homes are doing their own. Um, right now, but assisted living often don't have the medical uh, the medical staff to be able to do these, so they'll contract with either have to stay contract in or they'll contract privately with a, with a private entity. Thank you, Governor. I have more questions on 27F, but I, would, I just wanted to see if we want to finish. Yeah, sure. Any, any, any questions on this on this side in particular, Council Whitter? Yeah, one further question is: What is the spread between vaccinated and fully vaccinated? What do both those numbers look like? It's approximately 65,000 individuals and if one goes <coughs> As a percentage, if you have it that way, please. About 7% approximately. We'll get you yeah. the exact number, but I believe it's approximately 7%. Yes, yeah, I do have those numbers, um, and I can get them to you afterwards, unless Patricia has it off the top. Um, so the 75% number that you mentioned for Councilor Gatsis was that vaccinated or fully vaccinated? That is vaccinated. 
So there's not a there's not a large spread between vaccinated and fully vaccinated. It's a very small spread. So maybe subtract seven percent at the most. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But seventy percent minus seven at the most. Of the eligible population. The eligible population. Right. That's yeah. a very key point. That does not mean really to up to twelve years old. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Uh, any further questions on this item, or we can always come back. Councilor Morgan, do you want to talk about uh, an additional item? Sure. Uh, Commissioner, I'd like to talk about item 27F. This is the family planning contract for the Community Action Program in Belknap in Merrimack County. I'm glad to see this back on the agenda. I am disappointed not to see the contracts for the remaining providers, Planned Parenthood, Equality, and Lovering. Um, wondering when you, if, and if you expect those contracts to be brought back to the council. The new Title X language was brought to the department in the last week or so, and the RFP is currently out. Um, so we do expect to bring um, new contracts forward uh, around the end of the year. Will that RFP be retroactive to July 1? That contract? Um, I, I don't believe it enough. Okay, so we still have providers in our state um, who are providing services and have been since July 1 um, at their own financial risk. Yes. Okay. And that those providers cover about 80% of all the family planning services delivered in our state. Is that right? I'm going to have Trisha come up and confirm that. Provide a significant number. The number is probably in the 70 range, but in that we can get to the exact number. Correct. Um, I will note that um, Planned, Parent, Planned Parenthood of North New England will have the opportunity to apply for federal funds this October directly from the federal government. And those funds will not be retroactive to July 1. Is that correct? Um, that is unlikely. That will be their contract with the federal government, the Office of Population Affairs. They will set the terms of that contract. Okay. And without these remaining family planning providers, some counties in our state have no family planning clinics, including Sullivan County and Cheshire County. Is that right? That is correct. And the services covered by these contracts include cancer screening, breast exams, pap smears, STD testing and treatment, and contraceptive care. Is that right? That is true. And um, the the lack of contracts in these areas of the lack of family planning services will have negative health consequences for those who need these services. It will result in increased unintended pregnancies, increased teen pregnancies, and negative birth outcomes. Is that correct? That is likely. Okay. And um, I understand that some counselors here have indicated that they needed additional information about these contracts. Have you answered all of the counselors' questions at this point? We believe we've answered all questions that have been asked to the department. Oh, and still these contracts are not being brought back. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further discussion on this item or any items as part of 21 through 27F. Oh, Thank you, Governor. Procedural question. Um, how many times can contracts come before this council? How would it be saying no? As many times as the governor wants to put them on the agenda. I would request the governor put the family planning contracts on the agenda at every meeting until they are approved. Oh, wow. yeah, they, they can't. They, the governor said, can we fix that in the law? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> Constitution. Yes, Councilor Stevens. In regards to 27E, the Maximus contract, there's a fee, a one-time go-live charge. Um, we've had a, an extensive, long-term contract with this provider. Why are we getting hit with, you know, six-figure go-live fee? <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, this particular go live fee is in reference to this particular activity in which we are working to figure out, um, work with our data to ensure that folks have had their second dose of vaccine. As the Councillor Wheeler asked earlier, there is a little bit of a spread between first doses and second doses. 
we know that in the early rollout, there may have been some data that was not captured, and so Maximus is working closely with the department to ensure that those folks get their second doses. And with this, there was some very specific training that was required to ensure that the um, call center was working in with our vaccination program to ensure confidentiality and to understand the technical aspects of this particular task. Did, uh, did we ask, try to attempt to negotiate on this price? We did negotiate, thank you. On that fee? I'm unaware specifically on this fee, but we did negotiate the overall contract price. Council Gepsis? Thank you, Governor. I think this council was pretty clear about paying upfront fees. Probably three meetings ago, or the last time we met, or the time of that. But it was clear that we didn't approve of contracts that pay upfront fees. Love to hear your answer. The funding for this, they will invoice us when they set up. So it's a cost reimbursement for the setup. It's not an upfront. It's not an upfront payment. Well, there aren't many companies that I know about there that are public companies that people will give them a contract if they're paying up front for a setup. This is a setup fee, and we're paying them whether it's coming back later. That's just the same thing this council said no to. Um, I don't believe it is. Uh, what the council said no to was an upfront advance payment to set up. You know, what we had talked about was that most of these companies should be able to invest in the upfront cost without us giving an advance payment. So what we did is we changed our tactic with our negotiations so that they are required to do the upfront investment and then invoice the state afterwards their cost to set up programs. This is, uh, I would say, pretty typical to have your cost reimbursed when you're setting up a new program. So we can either do it on a one-time payment at, on an invoice or, we can, or they can roll it into their monthly invoice. Either way, they're going to have their cost reimbursed, especially when they're setting up new programs in the state of New Hampshire. They have to hire people, do all of those things, maybe rent a building, that type of thing. Well, Governor, uh, yes. I can tell you that I would never approve this contract. You can call it whatever you want to call it. It's still paying for their setup, which is wrong. And this council should be doing that. We can do it whatever way you want to do it. So the council is against reimbursing companies for their costs to start a contract? Correct. If, if they're providing a service and the service is $3, that they should increase their service price to make the accommodations for those setup prices. Because that's what most companies that are private companies do. So you would rather see their setup costs um, integrated into their monthly invoicing instead of a one-time invoice cost after they set up? I'm not looking to pay for their setup costs at all. You can twist the language, whatever I'm you want. I'm not twisting twist the language, Counselor. But what I'm looking for is for them to do business, as most companies in this country do. If you want our business, come in and do the service. If I may, when we set up a $50 million MMIS system with a lot of upfront hardware, it takes years. We pay for that hardware as they go before the before they bill us for the management of the system. To be fair, we don't pay for them upfront, but as they put in the servers and all this kind of stuff, it's multi-million dollars. We, we do pay. We, we, so there, I'm just saying there is a precedent here for, for especially when you're dealing with a tech system. They put it in, they send us an invoice, we move on. They put it in, and then we get to the monthly billing for the programmatic fees. I, I understand that you can do it. Uh, you can try to integrate that, but. My, my, my no, I, I agree. I, I think that the, the impression that we were under during the initial conversation was that the council had a problem with paying money up front before they started the contract. So the way we strategized was that we would have the company pay for those startup fees themselves and invoice them to us either... Okay, we're going to take a pause here.
change how we do contracts. I, I, did, I need clear direction from the council. Um, my impression was the advance payment was free purchase of the service. Now we are doing cost reimbursement. If the council does not want us to do cost reimbursement, then we need that direction to come from the governor's office, and we're happy to implement it. I don't know this council. What, what's the other thoughts on this topic? And, and just to be clear, if we're not going to do cost reimbursement, I don't understand what we're going to do because it will affect every department in the state in virtually every contract. Like yeah. every single, we're not we're not talking prepayment. We're talking about cost reimbursement. They come to repair the tram at Cannon Mountain. They'll send us an invoice for the new shift that goes into the tower, we would that's reimbursement of cost. If you don't want that to be done, I, I'm not sure what we're how we would do it. The ship goes in, we get a bill, we pay the bill. So I, I'm not I get I'm not sure. What we're doing with the governor and providing looking to provide services to the people in the state of New Hampshire and somebody getting prepaid without providing any service. I, I agree that would be a prepayment, not a cost reimbursement. And, and maybe we just need to sit down with the attorney general and discuss the definition. I don't know. I don't know if I think this is a discussion that perhaps the council could have when it meets regarding the mop um, and other matters, but this contract should move forward as with other contracts on our agenda that require cost reimbursement. Further discussion? Council Speaker, do you have a question? 27 Act. Um, I applaud moving forward with this contract. Um, I have the chance to speak with the executive director. They depend on the state for 79% of their funding. So I applaud the decision to move forward with this. I have a question for Henry Lippin regarding um, enrollment, Medicaid enrollment for women in the state ages 15 to 60. Thank you for the question, um, Council Stevens. I, I prepared that information for you at the last meeting, and uh, I uh, think I have it with me. But I think we were, we talked about that there was 65,000 uh, women in the uh, 18 to uh, 60, 64, and I think this was like 93,000 and went down to 11, uh, which was what you had asked. Uh, in between these two Right. Um, services that Medicaid is providing, um, it's everything from prenatal care to breast cancer screenings, correct? Correct. With mammography. As well, yes. Okay. Women who are eligible for these services in Medicaid. Yes. How many providers do we have in the state offering these services? In terms of our total provider network, um, we have uh, 30,000 individuals, but in terms of provide primary care, it's a, a smaller number. Um, and I think that was in the six or 7,000 number was the primary care that was provided. Do you sense that we're doing an adequate job meeting the needs of women in underserved rural areas in the state with our Medicaid program? I think that um, the, the services that are provided to, to women um, by providers of, of high quality. I think are we getting to all the women we should get and are they getting the access um, that that they would like to have in terms of timeliness. I think there's some opportunities to improve there. Thank you. Councilor Warrington. Um, <coughs> Commissioner um, Deputy, I forget your title there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the services that are being provided to the underserved areas in our community include the services of our current family planning network, is that right? Yes, and I think some people do access family planning for confidentiality and reasons um, and outside of the program, so that's, that's another element here. So both people who may be in the program and people outside the program for confidentiality reasons will access the many family planning clinics across our state, then many of them which are being defunded by this council, is that right? Um, so I think that there are no, no will be service gaps as a result of that. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Gatsis. Thank you, Governor. Do they provide the morning after pill? Morning after pill is available at your local pharmacy. So whether uh, I, I'm assuming that Medicaid pays for it because it's considered contraception. So the answer to my she, question was yes. Uh, I'm going to say um, yes. Um, without verifying, but I will verify when I get back to the office and I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll follow back up with you. So we think it's okay for somebody 13 years old to walk into one of these clinics and get a morning after pill without parental consent. A 13 year old can walk into CVS and get the same pill. That's not what we're talking about here. It's the same service, counselor. Thank you. And the answer to my question is yes. Yes. Councilor, uh, parliamentary inquiry, Governor. Um, so we had this item. I believe it's the same item as the late item on the agenda for the 29th, um, and now it's on this uh, agenda as what uh, a separate item. So what is this? Uh, are we doing both, or is the late item? The well, late item. The, the it's not on the agenda. That was removed. That was removed it was by the governor and the agency. Well. This isn't late anymore. It's two weeks later. Not late, it's just late. <laughs> well, it's, it's no, it's just part of the regular agenda. I didn't know a whole agenda could dissolve. I don't know if we've ever done this before, so I just... Well, if a late, item, if a late item doesn't before, then it's not late. It was it's put onto the regular agenda for the next meeting. Okay, so it's, it's not late. It's just both. That, that's my yeah. point. Okay, thank you, Governor. Once again. So I guess I'll ask, ask the question I've asked in the past. Uh, this 27F contract, the Community Action Program for uh, Belknap and <laughs> Merrimack counties, um, they do not provide abortion services to that. Correct. Okay. And so therefore, they would meet the spirit of House Bill 2 law with regards to providing funding to um, health clinics that do not provide abortion services. Correct. Thank you. Just, just yeah, Councilor Wheeler. Yeah. So, but to be clear, this is the same as it was a few weeks ago that someone, a, a child, could go into this clinic and get sterilized without their parental consent. Correct? That's in the item. Thank you for your question. Um, there are current federal regulations around that that um, in our Title 10 programs, that they do not do sterilization for anyone under the age of 21. So why, why is it in this contract? It is, it is incorporated the within the guidelines. Within the detail of the contract, it says you shall follow the federal guidelines, and it is within those federal guidelines. All right, I'd like a copy of that, please. We will get that for you. So, no, that is not allowed. So, this organization, 72.9% of their budget comes from the state. The services that they are providing, mammograms, colops, no, no, it's colostomy. Different, different. Um, the referral to appropriate health care provider or facility, and they're documenting, and they're tracking the patient. Um, so we're not sending them out for a mammogram only to lose track of this patient. Um, if the patient needs consultation or follow-up for other types of tests, we would initiate the referral, and this is for the executive director, send records and assist the patient in making an appointment for example, all pap smears are sent to the lab, the results are returned to the clinic, documented in the law, and if results indicate a need for further follow-up, the provider will initiate this, and by law, mammograms, they do have to send a written confirmation. Um, so what I'm saying, for a small clinic, they're doing incredible work. Our family planning clinics tend to be a bridge with primary care. Um, oftentimes reaching an underserved population that does not have access to primary care and this is a good example exactly what you talked about with having that follow-up and that primary care um, follow-up when people go into this family plan clinic. 44% um, of their patients um, are eligible for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay. Oh, sure, but then that 20, yeah, that's 21 to 27. Sure, go ahead. 20, 23. When are we going to get the Chicago Homes and Audited State? Um, I was on an email that was sent to you. 
sorry? It was sent to the council by Tom Donovan, the charitable foundation. I was copied on that email. It's not audited. Oh. My, precise, my, my question was, why did it stay? So let's, uh, let's ask the Attorney General's office because that is managed by the Department of Charitable. <laughs> Councilor, I believe they provide audited statements at the end of a fiscal year. Their fiscal year, they don't provide those to us monthly. I don't believe they've been providing those to us monthly. So I know Tom Donovan provided uh, their monthly financial statements for, I believe, August to you on September 27th. And the only way they met the agreement is that they were using their line of credit. I know that they, they had met all ratios. I can't speak to whether it was because they used the line of credit. Okay. Well, good morning. Good morning, Mary Kelly, Department of Health and Services. They met the ratios to include the line of credit or to exclude the line of credit. There's still over 30 days of cash on hand, which is our contractual requirement. That's with the line of credit? Or without. If you remove it, they are still over 30 days of cash on hand. And why are we going with a two-year contract instead of a one like we have here?
Start by 28 and 38 C. Okay, hearing no
every provider that provides this service in your region and across all the regions of the state. And um, those include um, individual providers, not just the known organizations such as an FQHC. Thank you. If you could provide that website to all the council, that would yes. be very helpful. Sorry. Council Jenny. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, contract is going to be a sole source contract. Uh, you submit uh, obviously an RFP, and that was the only provider that provided me. So um, I'm looking at 38C. It's retroactive, it's not sole source. Just 38A. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Um, do you want to? Yes. Um, so we did not uh, do an RFP because there is only um, a handful of people that are certified through CACTI, which is the CTI Institute. And Kim Livingston, who is a professor at Plymouth Station, is one of the is the only person in New Hampshire that is certified to do that. So if we did not go to Plymouth State, we would have to go out of state. So it's a particular program geared towards the population or is it the Critical time intervention is geared towards uh, aftercare, after psychiatric hospitalization. It's a nine month highly fidelity, uh, uh, fidelity program that we do care coordination and case management with our patients that are discharged from the hospital that starts pre-discharge. So it is a very um, evidence-based practice that is being implemented around the state. It's one of the new programs that we're implementing to reduce hospitalization and psychiatric uh, care and to prevent ER trips. Uh, so CTI, critical time intervention, like I said, is, is uh, known across the country and we just happen to have CTI expert in our backyard, which was at Women's State, so we were very happy to actually contract with them. Okay. Further discussion? Councilor Stephen? I just want to give a shout out to Edward Douglas Hospital. Um, they took it upon themselves to set up a satellite um, branch at the doorway. And if, as you look at this contract, though, um, they have the lowest increase, uh, 10%. Um, they're doing great work, and anything we can provide this wonderful hospital, the better off. I know my constituents will be. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion? On items 20 to 38. Okay, here we go for the discussions. All in favor of items 20 to 38C, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No on 38. And then no on item 38. Uh, 38. Just 38, not 8. Uh, the items are approved. Uh, we are approaching the kind of two-hour mark, so I think we're going to take a quick five-minute break. We know this meeting could go on a little longer, so we want to give everyone a chance to stretch the legs. We'll be back uh, five minutes off, and we'll see you right back. We'll try to stay in place for five minutes. Thank you.